Well, thank you all for uh, joining us tonight, uh, especially those of you who came in person and also to those of you joining online. And you know, to anyone um, who, who hears this later on the YouTube channel of the Leo Beck Institute. Uh, my name is David Brown. I'm the Director of Public History at Leo Beck Institute. We're an archive and library focused on the history of German-speaking Jewry. And um, we are here tonight um, to, to talk about a book um, by uh, Micha Gottlieb, a scholar at NYU in the philosophy department who uh, has also been a member of the LBI's academic advisory board. Um, and it, this book is The Jewish Reformation, Bible Translation and Middle-Class German Judaism as Spiritual Enterprise. Um, which, uh, when it came out a couple years ago, won the Dorothy Rosenberg Prize of the American Historical Association. Um, and we'll mostly be talking um, with our panelists about, or hearing from our panelists, um, um, about developments in the uh, 19th century in, in German-speaking Jewish uh, uh, circles. But um, we're also going to hear about how these debates um, from 150 uh, or more years ago uh, still have reverberations today. Um, and I, I won't say uh, much more about that. Our panelists um, uh, have a lot to say about it. And uh, I just want to encourage you um, to uh, take a look at a link we will post online, and we have flyers for those of you who are here in the audience, um, to get the book from Oxford University Press when it comes out in paperback uh, very shortly. Um, you can use the uh, promotion code AAFLYG6. We'll, uh, we'll put that in the, in the chat, and it's on the flyer, um, to get 30% off the book. So our panelists tonight are... Um, uh, in no particular order. Um, Itzich Malamed from uh, the uh, Johns Hopkins Philosophy Department. He is the Bloomberg um, Professor of Philosophy there and an expert on Spinoza. Um, Nomi Seidman from the University of Toronto, um, the Jackman Professor of the Humanities at the University of Toronto and a former fellow at the Center for Jewish History, and David Ellenson, uh, President, uh, Director Emeritus of the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. Um, but first, uh, before we get into the discussion, we will hear from Misha Gottlieb, uh, the author of this wonderful book. Uh, so, Misha, please. So, by the way, I uh, just want to mention, actually, I'm in Hebrew Judaic Studies at NYU, but thank you. <laughs> uh, so wonderful seeing everyone here. When I first read the New York Times article on Hasidic schools and the outrage that it provoked on all sides, my first thought was, gosh, there's nothing new under the sun. I'd like to begin tonight with just a little bit of personal history. I was raised in a middle-class Jewish home in Canada, um, and when I, but when I was 16, I became very interested in Talmud study. And after graduating high school, I went to Israel to study at a Haredi yeshiva. After graduating from McGill University in 1995, I returned to yeshiva to study. While I was in yeshiva, my grandfather passed away. Born in Hungary in 1907, he had emigrated with his family to England in 1923. As a teenager, I recall asking my grandfather how his family affiliated religiously. He replied that his family were Hasidic masculine. Well, I had no idea what it meant, so I asked him, what is a Hasidic maskil? He explained to me that his families traveled in Hasidic circles, but were not associated with any particular Rebbe. They valued secular education, and they dressed in modern clothes. After my grandfather's passing, I flew to England to attend his funeral, and my father asked me to stay for a few days to help clear out his apartment. My grandfather had been a surgeon, 
but he had an enormous Judaica library. There were books on almost every Jewish top topic imaginable, from archaeology to Jewish philosophy to books on Jewish communities in China and Ethiopia. But as I perused my grandfather's library, what stood out to me was the enormous number of Bibles and Bible translations that he owned. Not only did he have numerous English Bible translations, he also had translations into French, Spanish, Russian, Greek, Latin, and even into Chinese Mandarin and the ancient Ethiopian language of Gez. When I asked my father why my grandfather had so many tra translations, he explained that he would use tr these translations to teach himself different languages. But there was one text that was nearly entirely absent from my grandfather's library, the Talmud. While my grandfather owned dozens of Bibles and Bible commentaries, the only books of the Talmud he owned were two stocky volumes of tiny print that contained not only the entire 63 tractates of the Babylonian Talmud, but also several tractates of the Jerusalem Talmud. While standard editions of the Talmud ran to 38 volumes, include Rashi and Tosfot commentaries on the page and many other commentaries in the back, my grandfather's two-volume edition of the Talmud admitted all commentaries except Rashi. So at the time I was a yeshiva student and I was studying Talmud for 10 or more hours a day and I was barely studying any Bible at all. So when I saw this library, I found it shocking. <laughs> It was only when I studied modern Jewish literature academically that I began to understand that my, father's, my grandfather's library holdings expressed a revolution in modern Judaism that began two centuries earlier. Prior to the 18th century Haskalah, or Jewish Enlightenment, Ashkenazic Jewish education for boys was conducted in Yiddish and centered on near exclusive study of Talmud from a young age. Not only were nearly all secular subjects excluded, excluded, including knowledge of the vernacular, Bible study was also neglected. Girls studied Bible informally, often with the rabbinic homiletical commentary Tzenarena, and girls from elite families received a more substantial secular education. But by and large, girls, whether wealthy or poor, received no formal Jewish education. Beginning in the 18th century, German Maskilim and their 19th century successors, Reform, Conservative, and Modern Orthodox Jews, sought to transform Jewish education by placing the Bible at the center of the Jewish curriculum, introducing a, substanti a, a substantial secular curriculum, and after it, Moses Mendelssohn, instituting formal Jewish education for girls. The purpose was to create a bourgeois middle-class Judaism and in my book, I call this social and educational project the Jewish Reformation. I argue that one of the main tools that Jewish Reformation leaders used to introduce these changes was Bible translation. Prior to Moses Mendelssohn's 1783 Pentateuch translation, there were no Jewish Bible translations into High German. But in the century and a half between Mendelssohn's translation and Martin Buber's and Franz Rosenzweig's translation, which was halted shortly before the Nazis came to power, Jews produced 15 different translations of at least the entire Pentateuch. This was more than even German Protestants produced in this period, despite the fact that German Jews constituted a mere 1% of the German population. Not surprisingly, the Jewish Reformation elicited sharp opposition from rabbis committed to the old Ashkenazic way. Jewish Reformation activists were cast as power-hungry sycophants, eager to betray authentic Judaism, to imitate and gain the approval of Protestants. Advocates of Jewish Reformation were seen as latter-day Esau's who traded their Jewish birthright for a modern pot of lentils, pleasure, wealth, and social status. While tradition-bound rabbis were the first to mount these criticisms of the Jewish Reformation, these charges were later repeated in different ways by Haredim, Zionists, and advocates of Jewish renewal. A culture war was ignited in the Jewish community that exists to this day. The main goal of my book is to engage these critiques of the Jewish Reformation by understanding how three of its main advocates, Moses Mendelssohn, Leopold Sunz, and Samson Raphael Hirsch, conceived its goal. As my research deepened, 
it became clear to me that for these leaders of the Jewish Reformation, advancing Jews' material well-being was not the ultimate goal. Instead, their primary aim was to advance Jews' spiritual well-being, which would be achieved by returning Judaism to its true purpose. Now, the word spirituality causes some people discomfort. It can seem fuzzy to the point of meaninglessness. But Jewish Reformation leaders saw their task as revitalizing what they referred to as the Jewish spirit, Jüdische Geist in German. And this had a very precise meaning for them. When Jewish Reformation leaders looked at their tradition-bound Jewish contemporaries, they saw many good things. Commitment to education, devotion to the Jewish people, and commitment to Jewish law. But they also saw much that they thought needed repair. They worried that tradition-bound Jews had internalized a parochial view of God who only cared for Jews and who made Jews superior to non-Jews. They were appalled that many Jews saw their ethical obligations as ending with other Jews, feeling that it was okay to cheat and deceive non-Jews. And they lamented the lack of secular education that robbed Jews of an important avenue for cultivating their intellectual and artistic capacities. For Jewish Reformation writers, this was a terrible distortion of true Judaism, which taught that God cared for all humanity, all human beings were equal, and that while Jews' responsibility began with other Jews, it extended to everyone. This moral responsibility involved not only working to alleviate material deprivation in non-Jewish society, but also working to further its intellectual, aesthetic, and above all, moral development. What had caused this distortion of Judaism? For Jewish Reformation writers, the primary cause was clear. It was Christianity. Christians' murder, maltreatment, and ridicule of Jews had not only damaged Jewish bodies, but also warped Jewish souls. Christians claimed that God had abandoned the Jews, and their continual deriding of Jews as inferior led Jews to invert this charge and arrogantly assert that God cared only for Jews and that Jews were superior to everyone else. Christian persecution and denying Jews civil rights led Jews to think it was permissible to lie or cheat Christians. And Christian oppression and exclusion led Jews, to turn, led Jews to turn inward and away from everything they associated with Christian society, which included art, science, and even the Bible. But while Jewish Reformation writers had no doubt that Christians were the primary cause of, of the degradation of Jews in Judaism, they asserted that Jews were not passive victims. Jews were agents who had the power and responsibility to improve their condition. Agency began with Jews ameliorating their material conditions by working to secure greater civil rights and gaining the education and professional training that would enable them to rise economically and socially. But for the Jewish Reformation writers, repairing Jews' material condition was always subordinate to the higher goal of repairing Jews' spiritual condition. Poverty and material insecurity spurred theft and deception, which were dark marks on the Jewish soul. So working towards securing greater civil rights and economic security for Jews was essential for Jews' ethical character. Securing greater civil rights for Jews was also a necessary step in advancing the ethical welfare of society, since a country which denied part of its inhabitants civil rights was morally derelict. Improving Jews' economic state raising their social status, and promoting greater interactions with Christians was needed for Jews to spread Judaism's ethical teachings. For Jews could only have an impact on Christian society if they socialized with Christians and attained a measure of respect from, from them. But Jewish Reformation writers made clear that if Jews selfishly sought wealth and social status for their own sake, this would cause Jews' spiritual welfare to fall below where it stood prior to the Jewish Reformation. For Jewish Reformation writers, a Jewish curriculum for boys and girls which centered on the Bible was better suited to help Jews fulfill their true task than one centered on the Talmud for several reasons. First, the Bible was a text that Christians, especially Protestants, also revered. This united Jews and Christians in a common moral and religious discourse that could help Jews have a positive impact on society. By contrast, Christians did not see the Talmud as part of their heritage. Second, the Bible helped inspire Jews with a sense of their task in the world, 
while the Bible is mostly a collection of legal debates and occasional stories and tales, the Bible provides an account of Jews' task in the world by embedding their story within the saga of creation. Third, attention to biblical language and poetry helped Jews cultivate their artistic and aesthetic sensibilities, which assisted their internalizing Judaism's moral and religious teachings. Fourth, studying Hebrew grammatically and learning the skill of parsing the biblical text in Hebrew helped Jews develop their intellectual capacities. Jewish Reformation writers thought that the Talmud, the Talmud study done properly could also develop Jewish minds. But because of the Talmud's complexity, studying it was only appropriate for older, more advanced students. And following the traditional, they limited it to male students. Secular education was a crucial complement to Jewish education, not only because it helped Jews acquire skills that would enable them to learn an honest profession, but because it further developed Jews' intellectual and aesthetic capacities, speak a common language with Christians, and by embedding Jewish history within the frame of world history, clarify Judaism's place in the world. To conclude, many of the issues being debated about Hasidic schools were being discussed 200 years ago during the Jewish Reformation. To be sure, there are important differences between 18th and 19th century Germany and contemporary America and Israel. But I hope that understanding these similarities and differences can help elevate the contemporary conversation about the Hasidic schools, which is so crucial for the future of Judaism. So I'd like to thank, before we come to the discussion, which I'm really looking forward to, I'd like to thank the Leo Beck, Leo Beck Institute and the Center for Jewish History for hosting this event. A special thank you to LBI Director Marcus Krah and to the Director of Programming, David Brown, for their support and help organizing this event. And I'm absolutely delighted and honored that three eminent scholars, David Ellenson, Naomi Seidman, and Itzik Malamed, are participating. Uh, I've engaged with each of you in a fruitful, exciting conversation over the years from which I've learned enormously. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to continue and share our conversation uh, with the public. So I want to thank Micha very, very much, uh, not only for your remarks tonight, but the entire book. As you point out, uh, your book really directs our attention to the transformations that took place as Jews emerged uh, culturally and religiously, and eventually politically uh, into the modern world. And it gives us a very significant sense through the Bible translations that you look at, the processes whereby Jews were able to engage in this transformation over the course of the 19th into the beginnings of the 20th century. And for all of that, we are very grateful. As I listened to your remarks tonight, I thought particularly about a book uh, written by Mordechai Eliav, uh, the Bar Ilan scholar, Hachinu Yehudi. Bagramania Bitkufata Mansapatsia Vahaskala, Jewish education in Germany uh, during the period of emancipation and enlightenment, and the types of debates that took place as Jews began to enter into the modern world. The question was, what tools was it that Jews would need in order to be able to both continue to affirm their identity as Jews to understand the substance of who they were as Jews, and simultaneously be able to participate in the large world. After all, cultural integration became the hallmark of German Jewry in the 19th century. And when we think back to the time of Mendelssohn, upon whom you did so much of your work, that Jews in Germany in 1770, 80, barely knew Hochdeutsch, barely knew an appropriate German, but spoke a Germanized dialect of Yiddish and how 30 to 40 years later that whole situation had become transformed and Jews were masters of appropriate German language. Your book speaks to all of this 
and in that sense serves as a beacon for understanding some of the contemporaneous debates that go on even in our community here in New York today with elements in our community wanting to reverse the direction that these early Moskilim promoted uh, during the end of the 18th and beginnings of the 19th century. So with all of that said, just as general kind of remarks, I want to call both on uh, Itzik and then Nomi to comment on your book in light of these kinds of concerns. So Professor Malamed. Please. So, first of all, I, I just would like to thank uh, Micha uh, for this, uh, for the invitation, for the event, and, and for your fantastic book, and of course, uh, uh, the Lobeck Institute for the opportunity to uh, take part in this celebration. Uh, the book itself, again, as I mentioned a minute ago, it's, it's a fantastic study. It's extremely erudite, precise, insightful, and well-written. Um, I can say uh, that um, the issues discussed in the book have been the subject of a long and friendly debate between Micha and me for the past 15, almost 20 years. Um, and one thing which I really appreciate about this conversation is that we rarely disagree on facts. Um, most of our disagreements are just about the evaluations of the facts. I mean, and, and still, we have very similar values, but I think that we, well, I don't know, perhaps it's a matter of, of uh, uh, Micha being a bit more compassionate with some of the subjects of German jury, and I'm being a little bit more harsh, uh, but uh, we'll see. I mean, I think that you, you might, uh, you, you'll see that probably as we discuss, uh, develop our discussion. Uh, I think that Micha's description of modern German Jewish culture is essentially a bourgeois, and an attempt to create a Jewish middle class is just on target, precise and right, and I think that's an important thing uh, that he captures very, very insightfully. I also think that the description of, of this culture is reformation, or if you wish, as Protestantism, is just on target, absolutely right. Um, now, let me just say that, unlike Micha, I'm less sympathetic with this world. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not a fan of Jewish Protestantism. Um, and that's, you know, I'm observant, I have a kippah, but I like Apikorsim. I mean, I'm, Apikorsim are just like my uh, favorite figures, if you wish. Um, but that's not the problem, my problem with the Jewish Protestantism. I mean, I, I don't think, if, if there were Apikorsim, that would be wonderful, but there are very few Apikorsim among the Jewish Protestants. And in some way, I think that's a problem. So, where is the problem? Uh, I think that one way to tell the story is really to begin with the Bible. Um, in a traditional Jewish community, you know, if you read it, Birkei Avot, you see that Ben Chamesh Lemikra, meaning when you are five years old, go and study the Bible. At some point, when you grow up, two years later, by the age of eight, you start studying Mishnah. Easier, uh, or, well, I'm sorry, more complex, but that's the second stage. When you get to the age of 12, 13, you study Gemara. Now, the idea within traditional Jewish culture, the idea was that uh, Bible is for the study for, how shall we say, for children, or for those who are having limited uh, intellectual capacities. So you had the notion of the, the person who is just sticking to the Bible, I mean, you, you have the notion of a tilim zoige, the person who is just saying tilim. You, it's, it's a person who is religiously devout, but it, what we would call a simpleton. A person who is capable, a, cap, a person who is capable of high learning, and he's just dedicating himself to uh, saying Tehillim or saying Psalms, in some way, you know, people will appreciate the piety of that person, but it's a person who wastes his talents. Why? Because I think that once you look seriously and when you compare the Bible against 
the other canonic text of Jewish culture, which is the Talmud, I, I don't think there is any comparison between them in terms of just the demand that each te te text required. The study of Talmud requires very harsh and serious study, uh, demands a certain level of abstraction, precision, uh, uh, ability to make fine distinctions. I don't think there is anything close to that in the Bible. The Bible, for the most part, is a simple text. Now, sometimes, I mean, some par parts of the Bible are a bit more sophisticated, less sophisticated, but at the end of the day, Jews didn't traditionally study the Bible. They recited it. You can do a little bit. You want to do some philosophy of the Bible, you can try. You won't get much of that. I mean, now, the question is, of course, why then to go and get rid of the more abstract, far more sophisticated treasure of the Talmud for the sake of the Bible, which again is simple text. In order to answer that question, let me just uh, say that the word rabbi or the function of rabbi actually um, within, at least traditionally, had two different functions. A rabbi was on the one hand he was, the, a rabbi was a cleric, or if you wish, a priest. On the other hand, a rabbi is in some way, what we, is, is, also, is just a scholar. Okay, Talmud Chacham. Now, Frank, as just strictly speaking, I'm not sure that you really needed rabbis as clerics or as, um, priests within rabbinic culture because you don't really have sacraments within rabbinic culture. I mean, you have some clothes in some places, but generally, for the most part, you didn't need them. Still, you know, there were rabbis that were just so-called priests or sacerdotes, uh, as you have it in Latin. But the bulk of the culture, of rabbinic culture, was not really the, those kind of, of um, official rabbis who would say what to do and recite and make, uh, I don't know, uh, organize wedding and, and, and bless on weddings and stuff of that sort, but really the bulk of this culture was uh, due to this, this layer of scholars which we call Talmidei Chachamim. And I think that what happened once you lose the, ger was, once you lose the world of the, of the Talmud, you just lose this layer of Talmidei Chachamim. They disappeared in Germany. What happened after, uh, uh, shortly after the beginning of the 19th century, I mean, the, the yeshivot of Germany, which were fantastic yeshivot, got closed one after another. And by the end of, by the mid 19th century, I think the last yeshivot in Germany are closed. You don't have any more Talmud Chachamim. Now, some of you will come and say, oh, yes, you had the, uh, uh, you had the Wissenschafts and student tombs and, and, and stuff of that sort. I will beg to defer, but I'll be happy to engage that in conversation. I would say that the project of the Wissenschaft Student was primarily, I'm not inventing anything, was primarily to provide a so-called decent burial to Judaism. And the question is, of course, why? And my answer is because Judaism, traditional Judaism, was taken to be as an inferior society, inferior society and inferior culture. Now, where did this all come from? Well, it came from just simple racism and, and anti-Semitism that was quite common in Germany. And I think that it was, to a certain extent, incorporated and internalized by the Jewish Enlightenment and Askala. I'll have to finish because uh, we, we want to have a conversation. So let me just veer quickly to the issue of uh, cont contemporary Hasidic education. Uh, we are all speaking about the same articles that appeared in the New York Times over the past two months, and I, for one, think that there should be zero tolerance towards corruption and abuse, and when someone reports that there is a secular education which does not provide that, people should not, have, should, there should be zero tolerance towards that kind of attitude. At the same time, I also think that there should be zero, zero tolerance towards racism. And unfortunately, there were strong racist tones in the New York Times coverage of the issue. So when some of these reports were speaking about how in Hasidic Yeshivot, uh, 
boys are studying all day and know nothing, that's racism. When you think that if someone is studying a body of literature and you know nothing about this body of literature and you just say, okay, that's nothing, that's racism. So where does it come from? Again, I think it comes from the, this old hierarchy of culture in which rabbinic culture with its engagement with the Talmud was taken to be as corrupt, bizarre, unknown, ununderstandable, undecipherable by Europeans throughout medieval and early modern period. Um, and uh, it was taken to be as a you know, I can give you quotes from Hegel, but I'm not going, to, I shouldn't bother you with that. But it was taken to be as a kind of a backward culture, although, just to make the point clear, 99% of those who made this complaint had not even an ability to read three lines in this text. Now, once you have this kind of racist hierarchy of culture, uh, you will very easily send the figures who are engaged in the inferior culture to an improvement. And so, unfortunately, what you will have in the German Enlightenment by the end of the 18th century are attempts from all sides to improve the Jews, basically to make them stop being Jews, or, or as some of them would say, to make them human beings rather than Jews or something like that. I mean, the, the idea that they should become human beings instead of Jews uh, was formulated in very different ways, both among the Ascalites, among Jews, Jewish masculine, but also in the German Enlightenment itself. The notion of Bildung that was central to the uh, Enlightenment itself played an important role in the formation of this hierarchy or racist hierarchy of cultures, of those who had or those who didn't have Bildung, those who were full human beings, fully developed, and those like the Talmud like the Talmudists, who could perhaps study 12 hours a day for 25 years, but they would still not have Bildung, in spite of the fact that, you know, they were engaged in some of the most abstract thinking that you can imagine. Not, not for them. Bildung is not part of their world. So we know how this racist story in eight, the late 18th century Germany and early 19th century Germany ended. And I can only say that it is sickening to see a newspaper claiming to be represent egalitarian views pursue this line, which again, as I'll add, is deeply racist. Thank you so much. I can't believe you don't get up just like right now and get into it. <laughs> so, so don't go. Okay. This is good. It'll give Micha a chance to think about what he wants to say. So first, so thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Thank you to Center for Jewish History and to SBL and to David Brown here. I love this place so much. I, I don't know if you, I think you probably mentioned that I spent a year here as a senior scholar. I'm only more senior now. And um, <laughs> it was the best year of my life. And then of course, thank you to Micha for writing this beautiful book and for you know inviting me to respond and I'll just say something a little bit more personal because you did which is that I'm a little bit of an ADHD scholar I have all these different little interests that I spent a few years doing and it just so happens that one of those things was Bible translation um, and another of those things was Orthodox women's education and um, you know, when people say, well, what do you do in the field of Jewish studies? Like, where are you? Are you a 19th century scholar? And I would always stutter trying to explain all the weird little things I get interested in. And it wasn't really until I read your book, Micha, that I realized that those two, at least those two of my interests, are very um, in, um, closely connected, I think, in very interesting ways. So thank you for letting me know that I'm not quite as ADHD as I thought I was. Um, I mean, maybe I am for other reasons. So I'll also just respond to something you said, which is you started by talking about um, there's nothing new under the sun. Um, your response to these New York Times articles criticizing Hasidic education. Um, and I think that there's a, a, a kind of 
maybe little game I've been, been becoming aware of uh, now that I'm getting more interested in Jewish history as one of the fields that I study, um, which is the, the question of continuity and discontinuity. So finding things that seem totally different, right? You write a book about basically German Jewish Bible translation and then an article comes up in the New York Times and you're like, ah, it's the same thing or things that people think are the same thing, right? Let's say orthodoxy, it's always been like that, right? It's always been like that. Um, and you recognize it as actually historically contingent. So there's, that, that's one of the things that we go back and forth on looking for uh, surprising new ways to, to things that seem as if they would have no connection, recognizing hidden continuities, things that we thought were continuous, recognizing disruptions. So, um, I think there are two ways. I'm going to try to play both sides of that game. So on the one hand, you would think this is, we're not actually talking about the same thing. We're talking in the 19th century, in the late 18th century with Mendelssohn's um, attempts to, uh, to, to rethink Jewish education and to translate the Bible. Again, two things that are interestingly connected as Micha showed. Um, and whatever's going on now with Hasidic education, insofar as they play a role at all, as I think Itzik said, they're the other. They're the people on the, you know, from Eastern Europe who were not trying to modernize and secularize education, who weren't finding a new interest in the Bible um, in the ways that German Jews were, in the, let's say, Protestant ways, if we want to use um, Itzik's insights here. Um, so on the one hand, these are two totally different situations, and in some ways, they're, they're rivals. What I want to do is to show that the story is more complicated and that there are actually hidden continuities that, there's, that the New York Times reporters did not get that I'm going to try to uh, explain. So, um, so it's interesting to think about this, this question of creating a new middle class Judaism by reclaiming the Bible as a central Jewish text and by reforming Jewish education to put um, the Bible at the center, and to also include secular subjects. Those are the two features of the new Jewish Reformation way of doing Jewish education um, that carry through, right, continuities despite the differences between Mendelssohn, a, Maske, a, a Maskil, and Suns, who's a, a figure associated with uh, Wissenschaft and reform, and Samson Raphael Hirsch, associated with neo-orthodoxy or modern orthodoxy. These are the things that um, unite these figures, um, surprisingly, uh, so that, that's one of your chidushim, one of your, one of the things that you discover. Um, and the way in which you bring together this uh, Jewish education and the, the Jewish education revolution and the Bible revolution partly is also about the question of what's the difference between what the boys are studying and what the girls are studying. So in the case of Mendelssohn, uh, this is one of my favorite parts of the book because it's very rare that you read a book and someone says, I don't know why it's like this. They just say, this is the way it is and I don't know why. You're like, raising your hand while you read it. So I get a chance to say that I think I know why. So one of the questions that Micha asks is, um, what Mendelssohn was doing was translating the Bible into um, Hebrew, into German, high German, for his sons, not for his children, specifically for his sons and not for his daughters. And Micha asks, what, were, what was girls' education before this? It was reading the Bible, right? The Bible wasn't just for children, as, as Itzik said, it was for, Women, it's, you know, fairy tales, it's nice stories. You sit, you read the nice stories. You read, and how do you read them? You read them in Yiddish translation. You're gonna do this revolution of translating the Bible into German, and you're also gonna think about how to read, rethink all of Jewish education. It's actually a much smaller step to bring the girls from reading the Bible in, in Yiddish translation to, to have them read it in, in German translation than to take your boys who are supposed to be sitting in yeshiva from morning till night doing nothing but reading the Talmud and having them do that, right? So it's actually the bigger revolution that Mendelssohn did, reform education for Jewish boys, and 
really do nothing for Jewish girls, act as if they don't exist, I don't know, just have them do the secular education somewhere, or private tutors. He had nothing to say on this subject. It's true that um, Tzuntz and, and Hirsch did think about girls' education, and they produced, they were instrumental in founding co-ed schools. So my answer to uh, Micha, like reading the book, but now in actual per person, is absolutely this, the really significant overlap, the surprising overlap between traditional Jewish life, we're gonna just pretend that's one thing for a minute, and the new bourgeois German way of doing things is gender distinctions, right? The distinctions between boys and girls. The distinctions between boys and girls rested very heavily in the traditional world on Talmud study versus Yiddish fairy tales for the girls. Um, and if you're gonna now um, reform boys' education, you had to figure out how to do something different with the girls because becoming a Jewish Protestant, becoming a middle-class German meant also adopting a different um, gender ideology about gender differences, one in which um, if it's true that the Bible can now be for men, but it's also true that the man is the breadwinner, the woman is domestic, right? All three of these thinkers had things to say about women's natural spirituality, that whole Protestant Jewish kind of, let's call it, um, you know, new way of understanding gender distinctions that are, part of, uh, that are part of German society that Jewish society adopts with some variations. So, um, Mendelssohn didn't think about girls' education because he was interested in maintaining distinctions. This is one of the things that traditional Jews and German Jews of the Reform uh, Reformation shared. Okay, how does that get us to, the, to, to what I'd like to do is show that things have, have not changed as much as they may seem. So part of what was missing, I think, by the New York Times article, they should have interviewed me, they didn't, is that the th one of the things they don't understand is how the Hasidic world works. They don't understand the economics of it. What makes it possible for these boys not to get a secular education, not to um, learn secular subjects or the Bible, forget the Bible, not to have any of those skills, is that these skills are provided in the Orthodox world to girls and women. Um, not all of them, but at least in some, uh, you know, it, the question of how much Bible these girls get differs from community to community, and it's true that in Satmar and Beis Rachel, or Beis Ruchel, as my friend says, um, they do not teach Bible to girls. But in the Orthodox girls' school that I was educated in, the Bible was studied for, uh, I would say, probably two hours a day, along with Hebrew, along with secular subjects. Um, I can speak English, I have a PhD, you just heard, I have a fancy professorship in Toronto. Um, my brother has a GED. Um, the economic system has basically enabled male Talmud study through the strategic adoption of Jewish Protestantism, let's call it, but only for girls. So Samson Raphael Hirsch, who's the third character in our trio of Bible translators, uh, educational uh, reformers, um, is a kind of guiding light. He's considered uh, beyond the pale in the boys' school system, but when the Orthodox world had to face the problem of how to survive in the, middle, in the modern world, one of the bargains that they made with their German compatriots um, in the good, if we're talking now about um, uh, the World Organization of Orthodoxy um, founded in 1912 in a city between Germany and Poland, basically ultra-Orthodox Jews outsourced its girls' education to followers of Samson Rafal Hirsch's um, philosophy of educating girls. So what in Germany is a denominational phenomenon, um, Protestantism, let's call it, which is Jews are educated and worldly and can be in the middle class, in Eastern Europe is strictly for girls. And even in the, the strictest yeshivas, those same rules operate in some regard within the girls' school systems. So these are, like, like I told you, my brother has a GED, uh, my uh, still religious 
of sisters and, and nieces. There's three or four of them that have PhDs. It's not just me, the, the heretic, thank you. Um, uh, these are well-educated girls. So basically, the fact that it's boys that are supposed to be studying Talmud is enabled through a kind of hidden strategic um, uh, acceptance of the mendelssohn Sons hirsch model. I hope that makes sense. I've probably been talking away for too long. We could keep talking, I think, as we sit down. So thank you again for helping me see the relationship between um, the things that I do and for writing this very interesting book. Um, did I say how it comes? Is it obvious how it comes full circle? Yes. We're back to, okay. <laughs> I want to thank all of you for uh, your comments. I have a number that I want to make, but I'm going to hold back for a moment. No. But why don't you? Well, I mean, I think, you know, in part, I mean, I want to respond to really all of you. Um, to offer the critique it's a, that you offer of German enlightenment, it isn't. It, it's a little bit like asking why is the world, in a sense, the way it is? And this is what I mean by one of my teachers at Columbia, Joseph Blau, wrote a book, Modern Varieties of Judaism. And he ends the book with the question, was the emancipation a mistake? And I think what he means by that in the end was that because of the conditions uh, of emancipation that transformed Jewish education, and because Jews, as is, by the way, probably true of virtually every minority group when they seek to be part of a larger culture, uh, they saw themselves, uh, rightly or wrongly, as being inferior to these, this larger German culture that surrounded them. I mean, this occurs often for minority groups. Uh, I speak as someone who was raised, uh, ironically, paradoxically, in an Orthodox Jewish setting in Virginia. But the reality is the world I grew up in, I was always constantly aware that the Protestant culture that surrounded me was the dominant, and I would even say in quotation marks, the desirable culture, even as we continued to be observant in all sorts of ways. I guess the question that, I, that I'd ask, and I think what Micha's book points to, is that of course they began to focus on Bible commentary precisely because that allowed the Jews to have a certain kind of cultural currency that did allow Jews to enter into the, uh, into the larger world. Jewish integration wouldn't have been possible. And the Jews of Germany, and later on the Jews of Eastern Europe, to quote Arthur Hertzberg, they did not walk, they ran out of the ghettos. They just basically felt, up until today almost, uh, that it would be better to be a uh, professor in Moscow than to be a Malamed, if I can use that term, in a shtibel somewhere. And that the Bible commentaries of first Mendelssohn and then Suntz and Hirsch, as you point to, uh, indicate these kinds of uh, changes that took place. There is no question that Talmud learning in Germany declined over the course of the 19th century. Uh, w. C. V. Hoffman, the head of the Orthodox Rabbinical Seminary in Berlin from 1901 to 1923, in the introduction to his work, Malame de la Hoyle, he actually even comments, the students we train at the Hildesheimer Seminary aren't even remotely comparable in Talmudic learning to people from Eastern European yeshivot, and uh, it was common in German Jewish communities for uh, the Orthodox to hire Eastern European rabbis in Frankfurt and elsewhere to be the poskim, to be the halachic decisors for the community. And it was, as it were, a kind of recognition that the Talmudic learning that was produced, let's say, by graduates of the Hildesheimer Seminary wasn't really comparable to that of people in Eastern European yeshivot, but at the very same time, there might be exceptions so that Hildesheimer, who was the founder of the Orthodox seminary there, said, well, I have two students you can go to, he would say to his students, trained by me who can answer halacha questions, David Spee Hoffman 
and Marcus Horowitz, the Mata Levy, said, other than that, you either have to come to me or you have to have one of these Eastern European post schemes. So there is a kind of decline in this kind of learning. On the other hand, Hildesheimer makes it really quite clear when he establishes the seminary, the desire is to really create a wissenschaftlich kind of modern Orthodox rabbi of Torah im derech Eretz who can move into the, into the larger world. And given what the cultural aspirations of German and Western Jews were, the fact that the cultural characteristics that mark Jews by and large in the West until we move to the Hasidim and other groups today in a country like the United States and people like Ralph Cutler in Lakewood, et cetera, has been a desire to be integrated. Uh, it just strikes me that your critique is not so much incorrect as I'm going to say, in my view, perhaps a bit, a bit harsh. It's also interesting in terms of the gendered issues that, uh, interestingly, people like Hirsch begin to argue that young women, and as you point out, this becomes the model in Eastern Europe, need this kind of education. But one of the reasons that he argues for the education of women, even in traditional rabbinic subjects, is that uh, the education of the children, a gendered role, is contingent upon the women. And if in a world where Jews are so integrated into the larger culture, if the women don't have a certain degree of Jewish knowledge, they won't be able to bestow a sense of appropriate Jewish identity and knowledge uh, on these children. Uh, I have a, used to be the, the father's The father's right. task, but now it becomes right. the mother's task. Right. But it's used to justify, by the way, an expansion uh, of what it is that girls will be taught in terms of traditional Jewish learning. The last point, and Micha, you can perhaps address this, it's interesting that at the end of the book, by the time you get to Buber and Rosenzweig, what is true about Mendelssohn, Suns, and Hirsch is that all of them have fairly thorough traditional Talmudic educations, even as for political, cultural reasons, and to quote John Murray Cudahy, the ordeal of civility, which they need to undergo in order to enter into the contemporary world, um, they nevertheless choose Bible commentary and not Talmudic commentary for all the reasons that have been rehearsed tonight. By the time you get to Rosenzweig and Buber, you have two men who have, particularly in Rosenzweig's case, limited Talmudic education. Buber knew a great deal of Midrash and Hasidic stories. I'm not attempting to assert that he did not, but he wasn't a Talmud Chacham in terms of halakha. And you point at the very end of your book to the Buber Rosenzweig uh, translation of the Bible as interestingly an attempt to circumvent even the commentaries traditionally, the Mephorshim, which the other figures in your book all employ, these medieval commentators, in their own translation of the, uh, of the Bible. And finally, then, the very last point I'll make it does seem to me then that your book and even this contemporaneous discussion is that Rosenzweig, when he opens the Lair House, makes the point that a new learning, a learning in reverse order, is about to be born. And while the trajectory or the vectors of modern Jewish life are between, and I'm picking up on your commentary, that I'm not asserting that the story isn't more complicated than I'm putting it right now, but that you have tradition, as it were, on the one hand, and then modernity, this Protestant world. On the other, he says, a learning in reverse order is about to be born. For the people, for the most part, that you're writing about, certainly with the Mendelssohn, but also with Suns and even to some degree Hirsch, though it's a more complex story there, their problem isn't how do I employ Jewish sources to construct my identity. They've been educated in them. Uh, since they were children. It's kind of the Girsa de Yankuta for these people. And the issue is, how do I become modern, which is something they desire with all the blessings and problems inherent in it that you pointed to, it's it. But that Rosenzweig says, now learning in reverse order is going to be born. People who know very, very little about Judaism are going to now try to make Jewishness central to their life so that 
the binary continues to exist between tradition and modernity, but the way in which it plays itself out, the vectors move in different directions. Uh, and that's why I think with the Hasidim today, what's interesting is that you have groups that are consciously counter-reformation. And that is a relatively more recent phenomenon in the United States and in the Western world. And of course, it traces back to Kotler and others and Kyrgios Joel. I mean, we can talk about lots of examples of where it plays out, but these are the myriad thoughts in no particular order that I have. So I think, Micha, let me give you the first yeah, chance. Okay, I'll say. <laughs> the rest of you yeah, can thank respond. Thank you all for all these comments, and uh, it's greatly appreciated, and I'm so happy to continue this uh, th th this conversation here. Um, one, uh, in terms of Naomi, I think you're right in terms of, um, and I tried to say it towards the end of my remarks, we need to look both at the continuities and at the differences. And you mentioned kind of the socioeconomic structure of um, this distinction between gender roles. Uh, of course, there is this important distinction between in gender roles in uh, the bourgeois, but the difference is they see women as guardians of the home rather than going out to work. And you know, of course, that may be a distinction between mm -hmm. East versus West European. Um, but, um, but and I that's been that's reversed in the Hasidic world today. Yeah, right, exactly, right, exactly. Um, I, I like your suggestion for why Men Moses Mendelssohn um, didn't teach his, his, his daughter's Bible. I mean, I found it very surprising, not only because that was what women would normally study, but also because Mendelssohn, what he really emphasizes is um, the aesthetics of the Bible. Right? The, the, the fact that the Bible um, is, this, is this great work, contains this great poetry and this great literary work. And within the bourgeois way of understanding the difference between men and women, women are seen to have a special affinity for the aesthetic. Right? And that's why, you know, for instance, Moses Mendelssohn gives his, his daughters, they take piano lessons, and this is the kind of you know, classical um, you know, way of hiring tutors that, 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 that women have a special affinity for the arts. So in light of the fact that he reads the Bible uh, as a kind of work of aesthetics, you would think even more so, this should be something that girls would study. That's why he had right. to, <laughs> so even, even, he had to make the Bible safe for men. Right, right. So no, I, I mean, I, I, do, I, I do appreciate that suggestion. I like that suggestion. Um, in terms of um, Itzik's comments, and again, these are in you know, no specific order, uh, but I, there was a few things I tried to really show in the book, which uh, I want to kind of emphasize again. And the first is, these Jewish Reformation writers were not anti-Talmud. They did not say negative things. They all said positive things about the Talmud. Um, all the readers that, you know, the writers that um, I discussed incorporate rabbinic interpretations in their Bible, com and Bible comments. They think that in their Bible translations, they think that you know the Talmud is a, it can be a way of refining the intellect. Even Moses Mendelssohn says, um, and so they're not anti-Talmud at all. What they think is that the, they have a couple of critiques of Talmud study. One is you'd mentioned the Mishnah that says that you should study Talmud from 13. Well, it's 15, right? That you study Talmud. Um, so they thought it's really suitable for older. For, for, for older students, and they were very critical of the method that was often used. They thought that, first of all, children were being taught at age five or six the Talmud, they couldn't really understand it. And you had perhaps you know, uh, you know, a few brilliant students who could master Talmud, but many ended up with very little from their Talmudic education because they just didn't have the capacities to understand it. And it was really something for advanced students um, that should be only studied later by those select students. Um, and, and of course, in emphasizing the fact that Talmud study was, was not the most important thing, they could look to Maimonides, right, who had, um, you know, who had said that you just need to study the Bible and the Mishnah Torah, and you don't need to really um, study the, the, you know, the Talmud anymore. And I think this gets to a deeper issue, was, is that what they're really challenging is this idea that somehow study of Talmud is something sacrosanct in itself, right? That somehow there's something great in itself um, in studying Talmud. And there's this shift in this view of human flourishing and human well-being in that they reject the idea that study should be an end in itself. 
this is a rejection of you know, the medieval um, scholastic perspective, this kind of Aristotelian tradition that somehow the greatest, that Aristotle said, the greatest activity you could do in the, in, in the world was to contemplate philosoph philosophically. And they say, no, the way you achieve happiness in the world and the best that you could be in the world is active in the world. Study should be for the sake of action, for improving, for ethics. It shouldn't, it's not something that should be undertaken as an end in itself. So they kind of are really challenging this whole idea that somehow there's a sort of special thing about studying Talmud and becoming a master of Talmud and that that's something kind of in itself, you know, very important. They're also critical, they think that often these methods which are used to study Talmud are not really, you know, amounting to, mu to much. Now that could be debated, but that's the way they, they see it. And this is a kind of actually older rabbinic critique um, of, of Peelpool. And in terms of, you know, the, let me just say two more points and then I'll, I'll, I'll you know, kind of turn it over or maybe three more points. You know, you, you, you kind of suggested the idea that somehow Bible study is simple. Well, I don't think Bible scholars <laughs> would agree with that. And certainly these thinkers didn't believe that, right? They believe the Bible is a very complex work. If you study it grammatically, it takes a lot of work to do it. To understand the poetic, the poetry of the Bible um, is complex. To understand the way the different commentaries work, the way Midrash you know, these homiletic interpretations interact with the simple meeting. This is, these, are, these, are, these are not simple things to do. This is not you just read the Bible and, 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 and you get it. There's a lot of complexity there. Um, so you know, I would, you know, kind of, I think that was very important to them. Um, in terms of this building, you say, well, why don't Talmud scholars have bil building according to these Jewish Reformation writers? Well, what is building? We, 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 we kind of threw around this, this, this term building. Well, it refers to a kind of human flourishing, right? It refers to a kind of, 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 of human flourishing. And for these thinkers in the Jewish Reformation, it involves three central components. One is developing one's mind. Human flourishing involves intellectual development. Right? Secondly, it involves studying the sources of these writings. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, well let's, uh, let me just get to it, right. So aesthetic, it involves aesthetic development. Right? It involves um, developing an artistic appreciation, a sense of, a, a sense of aesthetic. And it also um, involves primarily you know, one's moral development. Right? And that's the most important. Right? Um, Moses Mendelssohn and others say, well, you know, study, intellectual development is valuable, but it has to be in service of one's moral development. And I think when these Jewish Reformation looked at these Talmudei Chachamim, they thought that, um, first of all, the aesthetic was missing, this cultivating the aesthetic appreciation, the sense of one's uh, you know, appreciation for beauty. Um, and they thought you, you maybe had some great Talmudic scholars, but some, of, so, some people who were studying Talmud, you know, they, they didn't think that it would necessarily resulted in great intellectual development. People who was being involved in just these kind of scholastic debates or arguments, that was their view. They didn't see that as uh, you know, the greatest development of one's intellect. Um, and of course, I pointed to what they saw as the moral failings of, of, of what they saw many Jews. They saw that they thought they had, there were these, these, these moral failings in, in the way um, they regarded non-Jews, right? And, they, um, and, and the fact that they thought it was legitimate to cheat them, or they thought it was legitimate th that Jews were so somehow superior. So this kind of just gets me to the last point which is, you said, well, they're just kind of internalizing Christian critiques of Judaism, and they're just kind of imitating them or, or repeating them. And I think what these Jewish Reformation writers are saying, well, just because a Christian makes the critique, makes the critique doesn't mean it's completely wrong. Doesn't mean it's always wrong. Just because you're, you know, someone who, uh, you know, and Christians ha had persecuted Jews terribly, and they're you know, constantly talking about that, um, but that doesn't mean that every critique that comes from a Christian's, uh, a Christian's mouth is wrong, and they thought that there were these real problems within the Jewish community. So. <laughs> there is a lot here, and, and um, you know, um, for me, um, again, one of the great things when we, we have these kind of debates for the past 20 years is that we, I, I think we agree on many things. So, for example, is the issue of the study that is valuable in itself? Yes, I think that's, that's precisely one of the major issues. 
and um, and I think that and what can I do? Yes, I admire our culture in which uh, study in itself is taken to be as having an internal value. Uh, I admire this culture, and I'm I'm, I'm openly guilty of that. Uh, <laughs> so if you have this story about Rav Chaim Soloveitchik and Rav Shimushkov meeting at a at a, um, at a wedding and someone coming and asking them a question, they said the question is wonderful. And then at the end of the wedding, so the same person comes and asks them, what is, the r what is the rule, what is the law? They say, we don't care, we don't know. Ask your rabbi, we don't care, right? I mean, they are interested in an abstract thinking. And I think that's, for me, that's cultivating the best capacities that human beings have, which is, I think, or at least some of the best capacities, not the only, which is cultivating an intellect. And so now, is there anything intellectual about the study of the Bible? Yes, to some degree, to some degree. I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, uh, if you want to tell me that, uh, that Numbers is an extremely challenging intellectual text, good for you. You know, I think, I, I think that in the phone book directory you find also some challenges. I mean, uh, I'm, no, really, I mean, uh, take Leviticus, I mean, try to find, I mean, the great, I, I haven't seen them yet. Uh, but perhaps, what do I know? I mean, uh, the, the Kabbalists found all kinds of secrets and perhaps. Uh, I, I have to say that, uh, yeah, that now, is there aesthetical value to the, to the Bible? To some degree, there is a huge, the question is of course, what kind of aesthetics do you have? I think that the aesthetics that prefers the Bible, just in terms of aesthetics, purely aesthetics, that aesthetics that prefer the Bible over Talmud or Zohar, for example, it's just boring. It's a kind of aesthetic sensitivity that I think that today, at least, for me, does not speak to for me at anymore. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm done with that. I mean, with that. I mean, what, why should I, I mean. Now, then comes the, the moral issue. And I simply don't understand in any what sense the Bible should be prefer preferred over the Talmud. I mean, the Bible in many ways is a text with, again, you read it, Literally, what? So go ahead, start executing Ben Sorer More, do whatever you wish. Rebellious uh, son. Rebellious son, right? I mean, uh, I, I'm proud of being part of the rabbinic tradition, which is saying Ben Sorer More, lo aya ve lo nivra. Okay? Which was never was revealed. The, uh, right. Now, but you should go learn the Torah. Uh, That's uh, the next sentence. The, the, sure, but, but so what I'm saying is that I'm instead of this kind of, of um, fundamentalist uh, Protestantism that is just sticking to the Bible, I don't know what you want, what, what are we supposed to do with the Bible? I mean, are we, start, are we going now to start, I mean, start executing everyone who is supposed to be, uh, uh, to, to have the Canaanite nation. Right, but right. they always read the Bible through the lens of rabbinic interpretation. Right. And they emphasize And what the that. Talmud is so right. beautiful and aesthetic and moral, and how about what should we be doing with Sota? What did the rabbi say about what to do with her? Yeah, yeah, but, but, at the, but Sorry, this I'm being said, no, no, sure. I mean, I think Micha is absolutely sure. right that they, when Micha is saying that they were not anti-Talmud, I think there, there is something deep and right about that. This being said, I think that as a matter of fact, I mean, uh, w w when we look at what is happening in the 19th century, Jew German Jews are incapable of studying Talmud. I mean, the more, I mean, while you had serious yeshivot in the 18th century, by the in end of the 19th century, as you, uh, as, as David just, by the end of the 19th century, you know, if you ask them to do that, the kind of very basic te uh, test of trying to study uh, half a blood with Rashi and Tosvot, not, not, they won't be able to do that. Now, and, and it's quite amazing because you know, there are s educated people, there are smart people, but when it comes to Jewish matters, they just become simpletons. They, they become super dumb. But I'm isn't sorry. your critique in some part, I mean, I just want to ask sure. it this way very simply, that the German Jews weren't Eastern European Jews. In no, other no. words, they, they have a different cultural framework and context. I mean, I, I know, again, we're speaking in sure. broad ways, but to some degree, it seems to me you're faulting them for the fact that they did undergo emancipation, and the fact is they did internalize different kinds of attitudes, even as they read the Bible through a rabbinic lens. I mean, I would go back. Sure. 
So let, let me respond. Well, first of all, I think that it's not only in comparison with East European Jewry, it's in comparison with German Jewry in the 18th century. Right? I mean, right. you had serious, now the question is, what is the reason for the shame in the Talmud? What, what precisely is there? I mean, it, so there are, in terms of morally, w attitude towards Gentiles, yeah, that's, there are problematic passages. I'm 100% sympathetic to any kind of criticism of, of Jewish uh, nationalism, that you call whatever, nationalism is the wrong, but jingoism. But this being said, just, uh, right? But this, just let, 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 let me stress that I, I'm not sure that the so-called modern Jews are, are actually in any way better. I mean, just think about figures like Fackenheim and all the stress about chosenness. Who cares about chosenness? <laughs> I mean, when you study Talmud, you, Talmud you, don't stu you don't study chosenness, you don't care about chosenness. Your job is to study Shoshan Agachta Para about the relationship uh, that are specifically issues uh, related to whatever, monetary issues, whatever, but there is a s mere value just in the study itself. The, the, the creation of this kind of, of, uh, uh, of, of an, a notion of, of chosenness as know, so central to Jewish identity, I think modern Jews, reform and, and modern Orthodox Jews has a, have a very important role in that, regrettably. I want to let no. you speak Thank in you. one moment, <laughs> please. I, well, you're not yet, though. I just want to say one sentence okay. if I can. Sure. I think what Micha said, I don't think it's so much that they're anti-Talmudic. The issue is, why does the Bible become central? And that's because the Bible is a much more useful kind of tool for legitimating, I would say, political emancipation and cultural integration into the larger world. And that's probably what motivates it more than other elements, but please. Thank you, sorry, I'm getting a little heated <laughs> here. So first of all, I have to say that your critique on some ways, I'm, in some ways, I'm totally sympathetic with it, and Micha recognizes me as the person who calls the German Jewish Bible translators the native agents of European colonialism. He doesn't like it, so he's arguing with me throughout the whole book, and he's really arguing with you. So obviously, I have sympathy for the position that says that Jewish distinctiveness, in other words, Jewish Talmud over Bible, the thing that the, the, the non-Jews like, the things that the, um, I have, I have real sympathy for that position, but I also think that there's real problems with how you're putting forth the Talmud as the great contribution that, that is the post-colonial, and we're in the post-colonial moment in which the Talmud actually has that kind of glamour, and it comes out of Berkeley, right, Daniel Boyarin, right, the Talmud as this distinctive Jewish practice um, <coughs> versus you know, yeah, the Bible, that thing that the, the, the Christians like too. Um, and I just will remind you a couple of things, including that the Bible is not just the thing that the Christians like, but also the thing that your grandmother and great-grandmother and great-great-grandmother was doing. Yes, that when you start preferring the Talmud over the Bible, you're also negating a kind of tradition of Jewish women's involvement in the Bible. Wait, I, no, oh, me, sorry, uh, one more thing. Just, yeah, please. So, uh, okay, I, I won't forget. So, I, and I want to say one more thing about Talmud study. That Talmud study, for all of its, you know, all the, the glamour of its polyvocalism and that everybody gets to speak, it's not actually the case. We know that, and um, well, I want to say something about Talmud study now and also Talmud study traditionally. Traditionally, it was something that boys were introduced to at a very young age, and most of them couldn't get it, just like the Enlighteners understood. The point was, it's the same way, I think it's as Shaul Stanford describes it as, um, it's baseball in American education. You're supposed to get enough baseball in your elementary school education so you appreciate baseball so that you then become a fan of baseball, in other words, the Talmudic Chachamim, the great Talmudists, and you never can actually get to that level. There are all these myths that if you're good enough at it, you will marry the rich girl, and it's a meritocracy, and anyone smart enough can become the great Talmudist, um, and the great Talmudist will get the big catch. Um, as a matter of fact, the only way to become a great Talmudist was to have somebody uh, sending you to a tutor. In other words, the, there's a Marxist analysis that's 
potentially that, that's possible around how Talmud study worked then when it was a matter of a small elite and how it works now. I've already described that kind of economy. So this is an economy where my education is diminished in the name of some kind of post-colonial Jewish difference that continues to privilege, privilege male Jewish difference over whatever it is that the women have been doing. And not only that, we're not only talking about an, a, a symbolic economics, we're also talking about an actual economics, right? We're talking about women. My mother worked as a bookkeeper in a factory to have this great, uh, beautiful thing of this pure study of immersion into the great Jewish thing of, of Talmud and the female labor that goes into it. I know you're a little bit of a leftist. Well, there's a leftist critique of the whole economy of the way the Talmud functions. And I'm very well aware that it has a secular glamour too in our post-colonial um, moment. And I'm not buying it, just like I'm not buying uh, the, critique, the critique entirely of, uh, well, okay, we'll just leave it at that. Sorry, this is me getting head up. Well, I think it's great. I'm gonna let Micha respond if you want to make any comments now. And I'm looking to David, do we wanna have Probably questions and comments? People in the audience. Okay, and then we'll turn to, Micha, do you wanna say anything no, first? No, no. So let's turn to the audience. Okay, one, two. Well, hold on, nope, no questions without the microphone. Okay, <laughs> wait, our, wait, wait. For our folks wait. at home. When you bring up Moses Mendelssohn, I think the argument is assimilation and secularization versus religion. Moses Mendelssohn's children converted. So, so he didn't even hold the line. So what, what, what I'm wondering about is if you take the Jews today, there are 18 million Jews left in the world. Well over 50% are secular. And this, this is not true of, of, of Asians, of blacks. Jews are secular. So, you know, this argument about the, the, the Talmud versus the Bible is, for most Jews, totally irrelevant, and that's the world in which we live. And if you talk about the Hasidic holding the line, um, they, they, they just don't want to assimilate. They, they're, 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 I consider them as a secular Jew with the lunatic fringe. And, uh, you know, that, that's the world in which we live. Is there a question here that you want? Pardon? Is there a question you want to ask? Well, 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 my question is whether this argument about Talmud versus the Bible is even relevant to the world in which we live. Okay. Anybody want to respond? Or? Yeah. You have to use the mic. Yeah, I, I'm sympathetic to rights of minorities and the rights of minority cultures. Uh, that includes the rights of Muslims to live in Europe without being universalized into good Germans or good French, right? The right to be, to have the culture of their own. Of course, that doesn't mean that they should, uh, they, that people would, uh, should allow to abuse other people or anything, but you know, that's true about anyone, true about, and uh, again, just to make the point clear, when Germans are today looking at, at Muslims as having, coming from inferior culture, if I were a Muslim, I would say, I didn't murder six million people. So my culture is not a culture of genocide. Okay, so let's just uh, cleaning the, the table. Um, I think that, there, so, so, so in that sense, I also think that people have a right not to assimilate. That doesn't mean that, that you have a right to, uh, to disrespect other people. I think you should respect any human being that is equal to you not better, not worse. That's why I, for example, I don't like the notion of a chosen people. It's not part of my vocabulary, my Jewish vocabulary. I'm, I'm out of this game, okay? I'm an observant, I'm not playing this game. Now, uh, it does mean, however, that I would like to have the ability to have my culture without being trampled in the same way that I respect the culture of Native Americans, and I think they should have the right to, to be, to keep their culture, right of Asian Americans, the same also holds for me. Just last point regarding... Uh, well, you talk about the rights of German Jews or Reformed Jews to have their culture, which is as hybrid as any other. Very culture. good, yes, apart from when it comes to the, to, to, uh, the Kotel Amarvi, 
I think that the main question there about the, the Western up, Wall. When it comes to the Western Wall, I think the main question there is about occupation and what happened there that created the the, the plaza that is currently uh, there. So I think that the uh, the issue that is most significant about the Western Wall is the question of the deportation of the Palestinians that were living there, and I think that both Orthodox and and and, and Reform women that are bringing the issue of of gender equality, I'm highly supportive of all, on all issues of gender equality, gay equality, everything. But the real issue about the Western Bowl is a question: is the issue of 2,000 people that were thrown out uh, from their homes in 1967 without anyone speaking about it. So, in terms of human rights, I care much more about the rights of these poor people than about the rights of, of, of a few um, WASP. Jewish Americans that are uh, bothered about uh, wait, so about the Western Wall. Wait, wait, wait. Now, with regard to Jewish education, with regard to Jewish education, no, no, uh, no. I'm, 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 you you asked about reform. Now, um, with regard to the issue of is the Bible the text of women? I don't know. I you asked me what my grandmother read. I don't know. She was murdered. I don't know what her here read. I don't know what her mother read. Perhaps there is a good chance that she was reading uh, Tsena Oena. Am I going to create Tsena Oena as the center of my study? No. Instead, I think that women should become active participants in the serious study of Talmud. And that's something which I strongly support, strongly wish for. I'm so you maintain male distinction through continuing to privilege no. women. It, uh, continuing to privilege Talmud, and then opening it up to women, this big favor, you get to well, be part of it. I, I, I think that the Talmud, as a text, simply is far more sophisticated than Senorena. You think differently. Please explain to what me. What do you know Make about the Senorena? Do you know it's put together from Yeah, the I, I read Senorena more than once, right? right? If, you, if you are able to put an argument why it is a sophisticated text, please explain. Uh, yeah. Okay, I, I, I just I wanted to answer this question. <laughs> okay, let Micha answer, uh, then we'll have one more yeah. question. Are you, you or asking, or are we out of you, you, you asking, what, what, I want to answer actually the question of why is the ta this whole question of the Talmud very important, right? Why is the question of whether you study the Talmud or not so important? Uh, you said most Jews aren't really, don't really care about this. Um, so I would just, this is a panel about you know, Hasidic schools. And part of the reason why the argument is that there can't be any other study, you know, secular study or so on, is because um, the boys need to master Talmud, right? So the reason why there is this whole, a part of the reason why there is this whole controversy is because of this priority, not just this priority, but this special status which is given, which has, you know, social implications, economic, but this special status, religious status, which is given to the Talmud. So this is actually a very crucial question for the, you know, the topic of this, uh, you know, of, of this. Yeah, um, I want to let Shira ask her question. I just want to encourage you, if anyone online wants to put a question in the Q&A, uh, we could probably just uh, And we, we have one more gentleman. You know what I'm going to ask that you do? Each of you ask your question, and then the panelists can respond. And we'll maybe conclude with that. Okay. okay. Um, thank you for coming. And I also want to thank Dr. Seidman and Dr. Gottlieb for going on the Sfarm Chatter podcast, which is out of Lakewood, New Jersey. Um, it's thank been very you. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. um, so I, I think, in my opinion, the argument uh, that the New York Times has against the Hasidic schools is different from the Mendelssohn and the other educational propositions which were all internally based. They were Jews changing the educational system from inside, whereas the New York Times and New York State is trying to change it from the outside. So I think a more parallel case, and I hope you'll address this, is um, the Russian masculine. And and the government trying to take over the yeshivas and the yeshiva Volozhin closing down instead of offering secular studies. I'm so glad that you went first because uh, New York State and the New York Times is not trying to change anything. 
over 100 years ago, there was a law. It is the New York State Education Law 3204 that states that every child shall receive secular education that is substantially equivalent to that offered by local public schools. It is only recently that the Rabbeim and the leadership of some communities in New York have decided to do away with the convention. And the convention was after the long yeshiva day, some tired public school teacher would trot across the street and teach secular studies, right? This happened. And um, I'm Shira Dicker, and I'm speaking for myself, though I am a consultant with Yafed. And I really wish that uh, my Yafed uh, uh, friends were here and not coming back from Albany, where they were doing advocacy. Um, I wanted to say one thing about the economics. First of all, the New York Times, and I'm not here to defend the New York Times, but that the spate of articles that appeared, and by the way, the New York Times was not the only publication. It, this subject has been covered widely. The New York Times spent over two years and interviewed over 200 people for these articles. They are well aware of the economy of the community, which is an impoverished economy in many of the communities where people are routinely on public welfare. And in fact, when a young couple gets married, one of the first things that they do is they apply for public assistance. Um, I have a question with all these comments. And the question is, because as a graduate of the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, together with my husband, Ari Goldman, um, I take exception to the characterization of a journalistic um, coverage of, of an important social issue as racist. I think you're blaming the messenger for the message. And I would ask you um, how you would propose that this issue be covered in a way that you do not consider racist. Whoever wishes to respond. Did you say that you're, it's your podcast? That's for, oh, okay. I mean, I think that's an interesting distinction between change that's imposed from the outside and change that comes from, quote unquote, the inside. And the reason why I had to put the quote unquote around the inside is because of this concept that I was working on with my book on Bible translation, which is this notion of Jews as a kind of colonial minority within Europe. So that, you know, colonialism, the, the great white hope, you go out and change all these people out there in the world and have them conform to European standards, that was going on within um, Europe too. And in some of those um, more explicit moments of colonialism, like the, um, the czarist rules about Jewish education, these were imposed from the outside. But the argument that Micha and I have been having, mostly on the pages of books, because we don't <laughs> know each other that well for 20 years, has been whether the maskilim, the Jewish enlighteners, the reformers, are, as I call them, but not just me, many other people, internal colonial agents. And I think I would actually be more on uh, the side of Micha than, even though I, I feel um, Itzik is a kind of very strong advocate of that position, which makes me feel good, because it was my position. But I think on second thought, thinking about that position, I actually think there is this distinction between pure Jewish cultures, like let's say Eastern European or Hasidic culture, and cultures that are untouched, that are touched by the gaze of, I think those are actually very hard to distinguish from each other. I think that's one of the things. And there is some real integrity to, um, let's call it the Jewish Reformation, the Jewish Reformation, which I think is partly Micha's point. point. So I think I started out where you are, and I moved a little bit toward you, and then I also felt a little bit more critical of this defense of Jewish life, which does have its victims, including people who, especially boys in that community that want to leave, as opposed to girls. It was a lot easier for me to leave. Um, 
the boys in that community who are really hamstrung and their futures. And maybe you want to talk about the health of the whole community. And I have a feeling that it feels very differently. And I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Um, no, sure. Just to answer your question, um, I think the report in the Times, parts of it are really important. They address issues uh, of the quality of life, the education, uh, and the kind of uh, um, uh, the kind of tools that you create for young people. And I think many of these issues were extremely important. And I think that it was, that, and it, it's definitely a serious issue that needs to be addressed. The use of the term racism was, in my on my side addresses very one very specific line in this report that was saying they study the whole day and then don't know nothing. <laughs> when you say that, the person who is, the person who is basically um, standing behind this claim is a racist. Because the person who is making this claim most likely know nothing about this culture and it's just, um, what shall we do? I mean, it, it's just, looking at another human culture with its good things, with bad things, with its problems, and just look at that as inferior. And again, that's racism. Uh, I'm gonna give just, you yeah. the last comment. Oh, well, I don't have any great <laughs> final comment to make, but I did want to address this point where I think the distinction between East and Western Europe um, in terms of external, um, imposition of uh, norms on the, uh, you know, on the Jewish community educational norms versus the West where it came internally, I don't think that's accurate. Because for instance, in Germany, in, in, in German governments, there were regulations in the 19th century, for instance, that people had to learn, that everyone had to learn German. Yes. Um, and so it, it's not, you know, it's not that the government was not involved at all in, uh, in, in you know, in setting norms for, for the education of everyone, including Jews, it was. Um, and at the same time, I think just as you have, you know, we have a representative from Yafed, just as you have, um, you know, you had, you know, this, this group of maskilim and this group of these ultimately these J Jewish reformation writers who were working to change things internally, you have that also today. So I don't, you know, I, I, you know, I don't think that this is suddenly, suddenly the, you know, some, uh, the, the, the distinction between these two, these two models is exactly what holds. I want to thank everybody for being here tonight. David, did you want to make a last comment? David Brown? Sure. Um, yeah, I just want to thank everyone. Uh, thank, thank you to everyone who tuned in online. You know, we, I think we went about 90 minutes, and usually at this point, I'm, you know, really wishing it was over. Uh, I wish we could keep going. Um, but thank you all so much for being here. This was really interesting. and. Uh, and congratulations on the book, Mika. Yeah. So. Please like and subscribe to receive more content from the Leo Beck Institute.